This week's episode of our show is sponsored by Patero's Tome of Adventure, the latest project from Penny Dragon Games, now live on Kickstarter. As a game master, I find it vital to have a wide collection of available options to bring in new adventures or NPCs or monsters and magic items into your games. And Patero's Tome of Adventure does just that by introducing a ton of these options available for your home games. Packed with many adventures that you can incorporate into your existing campaign or run as a one-shot, tons of NPCs, new monsters, magic items, and much, much more. This really gives you a lot of inspiration, and best of all, it covers a wide range of levels and genres, meaning that no matter what kind of game you're running for 5th edition, there'll be something in here that you can use in your campaigns. Even more adventures are available as you unlock stretch goals on the Kickstarter, so you're going to want to make sure to jump in on it so that you can get all of the goodies available as well as much more. I also love all the great maps they put together for this Kickstarter project. I find that you can never have enough of these ready to go, especially if you're running your games now online. So make sure to follow the links below to get in on the Kickstarter while it's still live. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin, and, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Today, we are asking the question, what would happen if everyone in your party decided to play a cleric? <laughs> Clerics are a very popular choice in D&D. They are not only excellent damage dealers, they're great support characters, they have a bunch of healing, they're full casters, and also they are up there with the wizard for some of the, the most subclass options available in the game. So they can go in a lot of different directions, and there's a lot of options to build great parties out of all clerics. So we're going to take that thought experiment to its logical conclusion and look at what a party composed of all clerics of different domains would look like, both thematically and mechanically, evaluating how well they're going to perform in combat, exploration, and social interaction scenarios, discuss some party theme ideas or build ideas, and look at some of the key strategies and analyzing some of the weaknesses as well as we embark with our party of holy rollers. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So we're imagining an all-cleric party. What does an all-cleric party bring to the table? Uh, you're, you're, you're a very specific setting when you're setting forth with this party. Absolutely, because clerics are strongly associated with the gods and religion. So when we have four clerics all working together, something must be happening in the world to get the attention of the gods. And so I think that there's two big thematic questions to ask when we're looking at our all cleric party. Are these all clerics of different deities? Or do we think about these clerics all as priests of the same god, one that just manifests as multiple different domains? In previous editions of Dungeons and Dragons, clerics actually chose more than one domain. Um, third edition, most notably, you chose two domains, and so it wasn't uncommon for gods to be associated with four, five, six domains at a time. So by taking, kind of looking back to previous editions for inspiration, we can imagine a god that maybe did have four or five different domains and build kind of a one god party rather than all the clerics serving different gods. And I think one of the great things that we get with such a robust amount of options for cleric subclasses is you can actually pair them together really nicely yes. to make themes yes you can have like your darker theme or your light and happy theme and like depending on which domains you pick and choose your party of four can have a lot of different vibes going on yes so i think one of the favorite ones that we pointed out right away is a party of life and death war and peace <laughs> It's like the opposing forces. Yes. It's like you have your, your life yin and peace, and your yang. Yes, war, light death. and dark. Yeah, I think that that would be really cool, especially if the theme of the party was maybe embodying sort of this idea of cosmic balance. One of the really old ideas in many real world mythologies is that the gods are opposed to the titans or some other anti-deity force that is out there. And so in those situations where there is a threat to all of the gods, 
even the gods of good and evil will work together because there is a threat that threatens the whole family of gods. We see this in Norse mythology. We see this in Greek mythology. We see this all over the place in, in, in religions um, where, you know, whether it's the giants or the titans or some sort of Lovecraftian horror, the gods have to work together against this cosmic threat to the, their divine order that they've established. I do like this idea that you have a problem of biblical proportions and yeah. it's either pulling all the gods together or when you go the other way, it could just be a war of the gods. And so if you're of one chosen god, it's you've got to get your god to win over the other gods that are that are in this uh, sort of battle of the gods mm. and have chosen their heroes. And maybe there's like a darker god and you're playing your, your life light... Uh, order and knowledge clerics who are like yes. this very like peaceful um god of light being you could make that go up against an arcana knowledge trickery and death that's vecta right there yeah arcana knowledge trickery death completely what do those four together tell you that's vecna the your god of secrets your god of forbidden knowledge forbidden magic you build that all together there. I feel like there's themes with forge and war or or even death and war. Uh, you can have like, there's so many gods of war and death and, yeah. and like <laughs> weapons and all of that. But I think you could also have your nature god in having nature and tempest. And then you could refine that a little bit by adding war and knowledge. And to me, nature, tempest, war, and knowledge, that's Odin or Thor. Um, again, a great champion of the gods type figure. I also feel like nature, tempest, life, and light feels like nature in essence. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have all of the aspects there. Or you could have life, nature, peace, and order as a god of like serenity of maybe even a god of civilization, but adding that nature and order and life and into that mix, especially peace, that feels like a very like one with the world sort of thing, like a very powerful nature deity that is trying to bring order to chaos. What if you do twilight, grave, trickery, death? That's the underworld god. Yeah. That's like your Hades yeah. type figure. Yeah. yeah. So I think that we have so many of these thematic combinations that we could use to amplify a campaign theme. If you get a group of players together and it just so happens that they all say, hey, I want to play a cleric and oh, we're all going to play a cleric. Once they've picked their domains, see if there's a cohesive theme and then maybe build the campaign around that. But, yeah, and uh, I think that, that that's where you have the difference of if you can find the combo for Because part of me is almost inspired of being like, take any four cleric domains. Yeah. What happens when you merge them together? What kind of god is that? Yeah. Um, I think you do get some challenging combinations in there, but the dualities are interesting. Like, even the, the god of life and death is an interesting duality. And I think that, that that's... It is fun, but you can, of course, diverge and just say every cleric is a champion of, the, of their own individual god, and they're, the, like, the holy Avengers working together. Yeah. Uh when we get down to our party, what is our top four? Uh, themes aside, yeah. what four are we going to pick? And I, I actually think we run into a problem here. Yes. I think the biggest problem is Twilight and Peace. Both of us in our first list, we both pick these. Yeah. And unequivocally, it's, it's well regarded that the Twilight Domain and the Peace Domain are overwhelmingly powerful subclasses. And when we were brainstorming our party builds, both of us came to the table with Twilight and Peace as the cornerstone. And so to challenge yourselves a little bit further, what's the combo that doesn't use these two? <laughs> yeah, so put uh, there's an asterisk here that obviously Twilight and Peace, I think we actually had the same four that we came to the table with, yeah. which we're both going to see in our list here. So we had Twilight, Peace, Light, and trickery light and twilight trickery and peace that is a weird combination it is but now but it's powerful if we remove so when when we look at that it's because it kind of covers all your bases but we're going to remove twilight and peace light trickery so why do we both choose light and trickery well 
Light domain clerics become a blaster. They get your fireball, they get your scorching ray. They are a great blaster cleric. On top of the already great damage dealing spells, they can yeah. put out a lot of reliable damage. In addition to that, they also bring scrying as part of their always prepared spells. And I think their warding bond feature is really great defensively as a as a team building thing. I love the light domain. It's kind of got it all, all there. And it really fulfills the role of our evocation wizard. Yeah. Then when we move on to trickery, the when we get to when we get to the two outside of these two, we're actually finding more of the middle ground of what clerics are. And all clerics have this like strong middle yeah. ground. So we want to diverge. So when we look at something like the trickery domain cleric, that's where you get your almost rogue aspects on your cleric. Yeah. You get your ability to be stealthy. You have polymorph now. And dimension door. And dimension door. And I, I feel like you got to have it. You yeah. got to have those yeah. two spells somewhere in the party. And this is the only way to get it in the all cleric party. We've also got pass without trace. Mm -hmm. We've got modified memory. We've got disguise self. We've got mirror image. The trickery cleric in a party of all clerics brings some really important utility to the table that I just don't think, I think we just can't ignore it. Now, for me, my other two that I'm going with are going to be the Forge Domain. Mm -hmm. And I pick the Forge Domain because, first of all, they're, they're just one of the best cleric options out there. They add a frontline capability that I think is yeah. needed in this party. We, we have a few clerics that can don heavy armor, but I think none of them can really stand up on the front lines the way the Forge Domain can. You can just stack your AC so high and get a really good bulwark against oncoming attacks, and somebody's got to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, my fourth pick is actually the Grave Domain. Their expanded spell list may not be the best, but they automatically have Revivify and Death Ward always prepared leaving room for other cooler spells. For me, I really like their ability to negate crits from the DM at level mm. six. That's just really fun. And Spare the Dying is not always the most useful cantrip, but the Grave Domain Cleric can cast it at 30 feet range, uh, just in a pinch, adding some utility support, getting people back on their feet. I really like the Grave Domain Cleric. I just think that they're a lot of fun. And so that rounds out my party. Now, one interesting thing is I we were discussing the life domain cleric, which almost was in my party. Okay. But you brought up a great point, and I, I want to bring that up now, that the life domain cleric doubles down on healing, which is one of our... It's our S tier cleric. Yeah. But with a party of all clerics, we have four clerics... We're not shy on healing. There's no, no there's no. no shortage of healing potential here. So the Life Domain Cleric, although one of the best clerics, I think the Life Domain stands out in a party where there isn't anybody else doing the cleric's job. I agree. There's, It's almost a sense of you want to share the burden of support across all the clerics. And this is an opportunity to really explore all the different things that clerics can do when they're not healing and supporting all the time. Everyone's going to bring a little bit of that, but we almost want to look to other places. So for myself, I decided to go with the Tempest domain for my last pick. I also chose the Forge domain too, so we kind of did end up in the same place at the, at the, in the end with one little variation. So it's interesting to see how even... The, there is a pretty stacked nature to, to these cleric subclasses. I just think that Tempest gives us another character with heavy armor. Mm -hmm. It gives us a really interesting selection of druidic spellcasting, notably things like Call Lightning and Destructive Wave, but also Thunder Wave. And this is something that we'll be coming back to a little bit as we, as we discuss strategy and tactics. But clerics have a lot of really good damaging area of effect spells, most notably spirit guardians. But what clerics actually lack in the battlefield control department are a lot of ways to force enemy movement. And so even bringing something along like Thunder Wave or the Thunder's Rebuke power of the Tempest domain, I think is going to add a lot of utility to the party and some really important combat tricks to help us really take advantage of all the damaging areas that we're going to be bringing. Either way, 
I think that it's going to be a strong party. Oh, yeah. Acknowledging for a moment what we are turning down with the Twilight and Peace domains, Twilight Sanctuary is a big deal. Yeah. Twilight clerics have heavy armor. They have great dark vision. They can fly starting at 6th level. And the channel divinity power for granting temporary hit points can make a party really difficult to chew through their hit points. With the peace domain, the emboldening bond is letting that whole party basically have a permanent bless effect that is on demand. So both these domains are super, super powerful. Although I will note, I do wonder if Twilight and Peace amplify the abilities of non-clerics more than they amplify the abilities of other clerics. Maybe. I do think that if you had a party that was a Twilight Domain cleric, a Peace Domain cleric, and two other characters of different classes, like two martial classes, or yeah. something, it would be terrifying. It w- Yes. <laughs> but, Genuinely. But still, I do think that if you had a Twilight, a Peace, a uh, Light and a trickery you have oddly a very well-rounded party that covers all your bases incidentally though what i think is kind of interesting about that specific twilight piece trickery and light is it's not clear who's the beat down who's the heavy hitter i i guess it's light yeah and in incidentally what's interesting about that is that all the clerics in that party are generally speaking wanting to deal damage with their spells, mm-hmm. which immediately makes the ability of the peace domain cleric a little bit weaker. Hmm. Um, obviously, it's still strong, but the peace domain cleric, ironically enough, wants to be paired with party members that are making attack rolls. Yeah. And in the all cleric party, we're actually not making a lot of attack rolls except for spiritual weapon, which we'll get to. <laughs> So let's dive into it. Let's look at combat, exploration, and social encounters, starting with combat. And I think that's where this party shines. This party is pretty unkillable. They, you, the, abundant healing is actually, first and foremost, one of, one of the things that's happening here. There's not a single person in this party who doesn't have the capabilities of getting somebody up from zero hit points. Or from death. Because it's pretty trivial for everybody to bring Healing Word. And I think you could probably be okay with two out of the four people bringing Revivify. I don't think everybody has to prepare Revivify. You, I don't think everybody has to have Raise Dead or Lesser Restoration. But you get redundancy. Yeah, if somebody has Revivify, somebody has Raise Dead, somebody has Lesser Restoration, somebody has Greater Restoration, somebody, uh, everybody has Healing Word. Uh, you're you're okay for any situation. Totally, totally. And of course, it's pretty easy for someone to max out aid on everybody to increase their hit point maximum. I think that everybody can have death ward on themselves as well. You've got the spell slots to spare for it. And in those situations where you need other forms of protection like dispel magic or greater restoration or the big guns like Heal or Hero's Feast or anything like that, the party's got that in spades. And so I imagine, really, all of these clerics are going to get together for their morning prayer session, casting aid and death ward on each other, and and then deciding who's going to be the one today casting bless in every combat encounter. Yeah, now, yeah. <laughs> so they're going into combat already bolstered and nearly unkillable. But one of the underrated things about clerics is their spell list has some of the best damage dealing capabilities. Now, it should be noted that Spirit Guardians doesn't stack. If an enemy falls into four Spirit Guardians, they're only going to take damage from Spirit Guardians once. Precisely. Uh, So this is the same rule that says if you had four Paladins their aura of protections wouldn't stack for like a plus 16 to your saving throws. If you have two spells or two spell effects with the same name, they're affecting the same target in the same area, they, at the same time, they don't stack. So technically, yes, you could for, throw four, four fireballs on the same area and something's going to be end up taking 32 d6 damage. But if you had four clerics that were all surrounding the same enemy 
and that enemy is over and their spirit guardians are overlapping that enemy only takes damage from the spirit guardians once i will still say that if your party spreads out and is standing in like a line like 20 feet away from each other and everybody has spirit guardians going what you end up with is a situation where no enemy can come close to anybody in that party yes and what would work is if that enemy for some reason moves out of one spirit guardians and into another or passes through separated spirit guardians then they would be taking damage this is where if all of the clerics could get something like thorn whip and you're just whipping the same character that's back why and i forth. have the tempest domain cleric with thunder wave fair, fair. <laughs> so if you could find a way to to move enemies through yeah. like then it gets messy but our favorite combo with clerics spirit guardians and spiritual weapon you can all have spiritual weapons going you can all have spiritual yeah. weapons so if you imagine a battlefield where the clerics spread out yeah. they all have spiritual spirit guardians four spiritual weapons and are now using their cantrips um toll the dead or whatever i think i think really in that party you really want someone to take magic initiate druid to get thorn whip because you want to be able to use thorn whip to whip people into <laughs> yeah yeah but regardless uh that's four extra bonus action attacks on the board every round uh not to mention damaging area of effects and then just cantrips being unleashed yeah and if you're worried about stacking spirit guardians you could diversify because well, a character can't take damage simultaneously from spirit guardians twice, you could have your light domain cleric drop wall of fire. Well, your tempest domain cleric has call lightning, and one of the other clerics in the party, perhaps the forge domain cleric, is going to animate a bunch of objects, and then our trickery cleric, maybe they're polymorphed into a T Rex, maybe they're they're using spirit guardians. Maybe they're dimension dooring all over the place. That's a scenario where you can have an enemy taking damage from all those different spell effects. And similar to our wizard video that we did, the all cleric party does have that same benefit of being four primary casters. So mm -hmm. when we look at these spell lists and with the expanded spell list of each of the clerics, you're going to end up with several different types of spell effects that you can have going on at the same time. And no matter what, that makes them outstanding in combat. Yep. I just think you could just pull great shenanigans by all the clerics doing something like casting command. Or someone using hold person, upcasting it to paralyze a bunch of enemies. Or maybe all the clerics just run into a bunch of um, demons or outsiders. Banishment all around. And undead... <laughs> Oh, man. If <laughs> Undead just are not going to make it, man. If you're the DM who said, I'm running an undead-themed campaign, and your party shows up with four clerics, just, yeah. just throw that campaign in the shredder. Y yeah. It... It's it's over. Yeah. I, I only one time, I had a cleric in my party, and I had an undead encounter, and it was over in the first round. Um, I thought it would be cool to have, like, a horde of skeletons. Uh, but they were, yeah. they were, like, a level seven or eight party fighting, like, a necromancer and his horde of skeletons and yeah it's just not not happening yeah that was a learning lesson for me on what clerics do <laughs> and that's actually one of those interesting things because there are other channel divinity powers that give clerics turn undead but against different creature types so depending on your domain loadout you actually could have a party that has a turn undead type effect like the, i'm thinking the nature domain cleric yeah. here um that applies against almost any creature type that they might encounter on, on a regular basis. I think the they're, they're going to have a, an answer for it in some way, shape, or form. Um, so we've talked about their amazing support with each other. Just having all of these stacking buffs, all of these damaging area of effects, all these damaging spells, Toll the Dead, Sacred Flame, so much healing. But what about exploration? Because... We've got a plan for most combat encounters, but that's not going to be everything that we're doing here. How is this party going to navigate that? I think when we come to exploration, and, and it falls off pretty quick, but we do have some tools at our disposal. First and foremost, 
there's a reason why the trickery domain cleric is actually pretty key in, yeah. in our parties here. The trickery domain, domain cleric has capabilities for exploration that the others don't. They have Pass Without Trace on their spell list. Yep. Um, not only that, but Polymorph makes them an excellent scout if they need to be. They've got the Sky Self. They've got Dimension Door. So the Trickery Domain is probably going to take some skills, probably through their background or perhaps their ancestry, that are going to give them skills that a cleric normally wouldn't take. Things like Deception, things like Stealth. Incidentally, the high wisdom across the party does mean that Survival and Perception and Insight are all going to be really high for everybody. I also will throw out there that besides the Trickery Domain Cleric, something that clerics all have is access to divination magic. And so when we talk about exploration, I think baked into exploration in D&D is information gathering and knowing more about what's to come, who your enemies are, where you're headed. That's all part of exploration as well. Mm -hmm. And divination magic can play a huge role in that. Beyond that, I do think our clerics have to play things pretty honestly. The cleric toolkit does give us spells that are going to just help us recover. So in many cases, these clerics are not going to worry about traps or hazards. They might just heal right through it. They could use summons as well to help them out to a certain extent. Um, find traps is not going to take you very far <laughs> as, a, as a spell. Um, but I think that they're going to do okay. I, it really depends on where the different clerics put their secondary attributes. You're going to want a cleric in there that does have a good dexterity, someone with a good intelligence, someone with a good charisma, someone with a good strength score. And that'll give you at least the skill use. It's not going to be fantastic, but combined with the other cleric buffs, it'll probably be passable. All clerics, of course, have enhance ability. Yeah. So they can just say, all right, everybody needs to have advantage on their strength checks. Everybody needs advantage on their charisma checks. Everybody needs advantage on their intelligence checks. Enhance ability away. Yeah, and I, I think that we're doing okay with exploration and our skill checks and all of that. I, I do think that you're going to want to make sure that your trickery domain cleric has an okay charisma and maybe proficiency in deception or persuasion. Yeah. Because when we get to the social encounters, I think this is the weakest link for the all cleric party. We don't really yeah. have charm magic. No, we have a little bit of it with the trickery domain. And once again, we can use enhance ability to help us power through by giving us advantage. Yeah, but we're, we're kind of like beating down the door rather than opening it gracefully. Yes. It's, it, we got we to gotta force our way through social encounters using magic and, and hopeful dice rolls. Yeah, I guess maybe you could use command in a pinch. That's a little morally dubious, but there, there's some there's some options there, and it simply might be in social interaction situations that might be where the role playing element of your clerics comes into play because the gods are influential themselves, and it might be that relying on that role playing of presenting your party as the emissaries of the gods or the champions of the gods is an important cornerstone of how you win people over in social interactions. Until you get to the town that doesn't like the gods. Indeed. And depending on your individual party members, religious views, they those things could impose certain restrictions on the types of social interactions your party engages in. Maybe you're, you're all clerics of a very moral, upstanding deity who doesn't like lying. That can put you in some interesting, restrictive situations. Um, fortunately... Again, high insight all around. You're going to be able to discern the motives of those you're interacting with pretty well. And so it might be that a couple well-chosen words of wisdom, the um, omens of the gods, and the exemplars that your party represents are how you're going to carry the day in those situations. But I don't think you're going to be doing any sort of underhanded business very well here. I will say that like social encounters are always tough because we rely on charisma a lot for mechanical use. But... Depending on your DM, wisdom could come into play yep. in social encounters. If you're throwing out wise words and uh, sort of being a sage to the people around you, even if you're not the most charismatic person, a lot of philosophers may not have been the most charismatic, but they had a lot of insightful things to say, mm -hmm. and people wanted to gather around and listen to them. 
uh, and that you could be the philosopher of your group. Yeah. I will say that combat is our strongest pillar. Exploration, we have our tools to get by. Social, we're going to need to figure it out. Yeah, that's going to be the biggest challenge. And I think as we look at the absolute winning strategies here, this is where the, the winning strategies of the clerics also tie into what I think is a potential weakness or pitfall of this party. Because it's very easy for clerics with their spell lists to take the staples and load up on all the support spells and be left without a lot of options for handling diverse scenarios. This is where I think that the party will actually want to communicate. Do the mental calculations on whether a spell like spiritual weapon is worth having four times. Yeah. Or if somebody's like, hey, I'm taking spirit guardians, I'm taking spirit guardians, the light domain cleric says, I'm going to take a uh, wall of fire. Or uh, Those are different leveled spells, but you get where I'm going. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you kind of diversify a little bit so that you have different areas of effects, different battlefield control. There's a lot of niche spells on the cleric list. And I think in an all cleric party is the perfect time for one person to be like, I'm going to take this obscure spell that might come up once or twice, but hey, yeah. let me... I, and I mean, you get to change your loadout every day. You do. And that's a huge strength with the clerics is that every day you do your morning prayers and you can all decide, are we all going to double down on the same strategy or are we going to make sure that we're covering all of our bases? Is today the day that everybody brings spiritual weapon, everybody brings revivify, everybody brings healing word? Maybe not. Maybe we're going to spread things out a little bit and make sure that we have all those tools that we need in our toolbox together. I think that one sort that there are certain spells that I think I probably would just take four of. I, I think everyone's going to take Healing Word. I don't think everybody should take Bless. I think that I don't think everybody should take Revivify. I do think that you need to be cognizant of who is doing the passive buffing as well. Does everybody need to prepare aid? No. But should one character be the one who uses all their spell slots to cast aid, death ward, protection from poison, hero's feast, all on everybody? No, that responsibility should get shared amongst all the party members so that not one person isn't just emptying all their spell slots at the start of the day. So when we're talking about the weaknesses, it's, it's first of all talking about the di diversity of spell choice. Make sure that you are communicating with your party. But one thing that I think that clerics have that's actually a tricky feature to overcome, most of their spells, damage dealing spells, deal with saving throws. There's very few spells that the clerics have that are direct damage or yeah. uh, an actual attack roll. And the higher levels you get, the more saving throws and bypassing them becomes harder. Yes, and while we do have options for some of the clerics to have a decent melee attack, it's still not going to be the most exciting thing. I have seen builds for clerics that focus on combat, but most of them result in multiclassing in some way, shape, or form, which in our in this series, multiclassing is a little off the table. That would really help things if we could do that, because we could have our war domain cleric that grabs some fighter levels and gets extra attack. We don't have any way of doing that. And so if we're running into monsters that have legendary resistance, magic resistance, or just really high saving throws, in particular, a lot of cleric damage dealing targets wisdom saving throws, which when they're high, they're very high. Yeah. That's where it is worthwhile looking at, hey, did everyone take the spells that rely on constitution saving throws? Did everyone rely on the ones that rely on dexterity saving throws? wisdom make sure that you spread out the different saving throw types and have damage dealing options for all of those that's another reason why it's probably not worthwhile everybody doubling down on spirit guardians because spirit guardians is wisdom save based so if you run up against an enemy with a really good wisdom save now your damage just tanks i will also say when it comes to cantrip selection my go-to is toll the dead but if all four clerics are using toll the dead that's you're you're actually lessening your chances of dealing decent damage with cantrips. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so it's probably still worthwhile having sacred flame 
And that's also why you want to have, say, the Tempest Domain Cleric and the Light Domain Cleric, because they're going to bring those Dexterity ba Saving Throw based spells, or even in some cases the Constitution based Saving Throw damage dealing spells. So all in all, I actually think that the All Cleric Party is really, really powerful. Uh, they yeah. have their weaknesses, but their weaknesses are not many. And really, as long as you're communicating and preparing, which is something that clerics like to do, mm -hmm. you're able to overcome your weaknesses pretty readily. I think that there's a lot of great themes on the table here for your biblical campaign. Yeah. Maybe you're the group going against the dark entities, the rival cult, or you're the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Exactly. Death, war... What would the other two... The, the traditional other two horsemen are, are famine and pestilence. Yeah. So would you go with... Nature could be famine if you could also twist be pestilence. it. Or pestilence. Yeah. You could twist a nature domain, Claire. Grave could be famine. It, Death, they could. Yeah, they could, if yeah. you're not doubling up on domains. Twilight could also work for, for famine in a... Like, because the sun's going down, the fields aren't being we could stretch the theme like just because you're picking a domain doesn't mean that you like you could role play it differently you yeah. could have different themes so you could play the four horsemen of the apocalypse and play a very dark all cleric campaign. i also like the idea of being the arcana knowledge trickery and death party that are worshipers of vecna and that they are all working together to like resurrect vecna or to go even further with it okay so in the old days of Dragon Magazine, there was a the Age of Worms adventure path. Yeah. And in the Age of Worms adventure path, that was all around resurrecting the god Cuss. But one of the things that was also mentioned in that campaign, there was a villainous organization called the Eben Triad. And this was a union of the worshippers of... I, I'm pretty sure it was Hextor... Nerol and Aaron Thule, which were three third edition gods that are now pretty obscure. But basically this cult believed that those three gods could be merged together into one god. And so you could have this super heretical belief that you all worship different gods, but you believe that they're going to like be merged together Voltron style. Into, Voltron like, God, we the God yeah. of the God Voltron, the becoming God, yeah, or, um, yeah. Okay, I got, I got, I got an idea here. Since we're an all cleric party and we're doing biblical stories, all four of your clerics have had a shared vision of a coming flood, and they have to collect animals and resources, <laughs> and get gather a town together to build a giant ark to save humanity when the coming flood okay, comes. That that could be cool. I mean, the other, the other, like, apocalyptic sort of thing is Ragnarok. Yeah. Right? Where it is, you are the warriors of the gods. Maybe your characters... Okay. In a twist on, like, a Charlie's Angels thing, you could be Odin's Valkyries. Love it. Already love it. Yeah, that could be really cool. Like You had me at Charlie's Angels. Well, what if that... That could be an interesting, actual way of bringing the campaign together. What if all your clerics are like resurrected heroes of the gods or they all died on a battlefield together, but the gods have sent them back imbued with divine power? You know, OK, I, I, going back to my Noah's Ark, remove the Noah's Ark theme. But but what I started with there was the shared vision. And I also think that that could bring yeah. the party together, even if you're from four separate gods. Well, the idea of prophets and yeah. prophecy. You all yeah. have the same. You all have the same vision. Each of your gods has a prophecy of the coming end of the world. The four of you are the ones who had the vision, so you kind of band together. And all the gods have a different piece of the prophecy. Yeah. Right? And maybe there is like some sort of divine thing where like the gods cannot the gods have to act through mortals to realize this prophecy. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that could be super interesting. I wonder also if there's an interesting way of bringing in like Bahamut and Tiamat. And the dragon gods into this sort of idea? Everybody plays a dragonborn cleric. That could be cool, too. Do we give the all cleric party? I give it an A+. Plus. I agree with that. I think it has some weaknesses. 
I actually think that the all wizard party is stronger. I do too. I think that the... I think, for me, the difference between the all cleric and the all wizard party is I feel like the all wizard party has way more opportunity for shenaniganery and gets more out of their downtime. If if an all wizard party can accumulate gold in downtime, yeah. they break the world. Whereas the all cleric party, they just have to play it a little bit more honestly. Uh, the all cleric party wins in, like, sheer force. I think the biggest thing that the clerics have over the wizards, the clerics have a lot more resilience. Uh, the That is the one thing. The So the all wizard party, uh, I should say this, if we're giving this an A and the wizards an S, I will say that from levels one to five, wizards are a D and clerics are an S. <laughs> it's like from levels one to five, yeah. you can punch the wizard party and they all die. The cleric party can't die. It just... Yep. They're yeah. unkillable. They're they're they start out the gate strong, but I think it's the one of the, and this is a thing that I just feel about clerics in general in fifth edition is I do feel that the cleric spell list starts to get a little thin as you get to higher levels of play. Yes, you've got Heroes Feast. Yes, you've got Word, Word of Recall. You still have Sunburst, and you've got Temple of the Gods for downtime stuff. You have some powerful spells, and then you do have Divine Intervention. Yeah. And that's another interesting thing is that with four clerics, your odds of getting a divine intervention happening go up. You all call out to your gods at the same time. Who answers? Who answers? Yeah, who Um, answers? So I do think what we end up here is the clerics have a very strong foundation and kind of get thinner as levels go on. Yeah. The wizards are the opposite. They start with a very weak foundation, but they get stronger as as the adventure goes on. I really don't think that there's much that... A party of clerics can't handle. I I do think that these. I mean, we've started with wizards and clerics, and the clerics may very well also be S here. We just haven't made full comparisons yeah. yet. You know, one other thing that I think the clerics do have over the wizard. What? I think the clerics are better at dealing with a situation that they don't know. Yeah. Right. Like the the generic cleric preparations are still pretty good and will carry the day for you. The clerics have as much divination as the wizards do. They can take as much ad- ad- advantage of preparation. It's just that the the spell list doesn't go bonkers at higher levels. Like the I mean, you can't have four contingencies, four simulacrums, yeah. four clones. It, um, yeah, it, it just, that's the thing, it, is that at higher levels, it just doesn't go off the walls. Th- that... That being said, though, I I think that we've started with two of the strongest classes. Totally. I, I, I think that there's one or two possible ones that give the clerics and the wizards a run for their money. Yeah, but I, um, I think there's several that aren't going to come close to no, the possibilities. No. Yeah. Um, so, you know what? I'm going to change my vote. I'm giving them an S as well. Okay. I don't think you're wrong. I, do, I don't think you're wrong to say that the clerics are S tier. I think it's A plus for me. Cool. I, I, again, I just favor the... I, I think it's me favoring the glass cannon sort of play style. I don't mind that. Whereas the clerics absolutely have a larger room for error. They, they come out the gate. Some of them are going to be wearing heavy armor. Yeah. They're... Their healing is off the charts, something that the wizards have none of. So their their resilience, their ability to be tanks and damage dealers out the gate is far superior to the wizard. At level 20, the wizards are going to mop the floor. Yeah. As the, the wizards will be the strongest four-person party at level 20 no matter what. That's just the way they're built. But if we're thinking of campaigns, I think the clerics have a better chance of that 1 to 13 yeah. area that we're mostly playing in of being consistent. You know, and another thing that we didn't mention too much of, because clerics have less of it, but they do have a lot of it, is clerics still can create undead. Yeah. You can have necromancy happening with clerics, and they still do have some pretty powerful summoning magic. If you summon four angels to fight with you... Yeah, that... it, re- it they, there's a lot that they can get up to with that stuff too. So I think in that light, 
I I don't disagree with you. I'm still going to go with A+. Plus. Cool. Yeah. Tell us what your ranking is for the All Cleric Party, and tell us if you think they're the strongest, second strongest, or if there's another all group, one group party that uh, that you think yeah. beats them. I also want to hear about your favorite fun and flavorful four domain combinations. What god is it? What is the story there? What is the divine apocalypse that is happening in that scenario? What brings the, those disparate worshippers together? How do you pair up the different gods and the different domains when they're all coming together as the champions of the gods? Tell us about all of this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. The videos that we make on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you want to get in on our Patreon community and get onto our patron-only Discord server where you can chat with us about all things D&D, follow the links down in the description below. And if you want to see us struggling with no clerics in our party, <laughs> you can watch our live campaign in the world of Draconheim, which is Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we got plenty more tier ranking content and character building guides for 5th edition right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and ring that bell so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.